our focus, uh, this theme is the Jesus Followers Discipleship 101. Uh, and, and today we, we uh, focus on this sub theme on the job training, uh, dear, dear Christian friends. How, um, how many of you have seen that commercial? I mean, it, it's, it's a football day, right? There's, so I, I can t- talk about the football commercials. Is that okay? There's two big games. Okay. So how many of you have seen that commercial? Where, where there's this guy, and he's a pro football quarterback. And then they just start going back in time. And, and everybody said, oh, he's great, oh, this is wonderful. Listen. And then he starts going back in time, and, and he's in college, and a coach is showing him how to do stuff. And he's in high school, and a coach is showing him how to do stuff. And he's in grade school, and a coach is showing him how to do stuff. And he's less than grade school. He's a real small little boy, maybe six or seven, would you say? And, and they're on the outside of a football game. Uh, and... Um, it looks like it's sold out, so they can't get into the game. But again, his dad has, what, what, what would that could be called, Phil? A what? One of those things. Okay. His dad has one of those things, right? And so he's able to get the tickets for they're sold out. Before they're sold out. And because of that, they get to go in the game. And at that game, the little boy is jazzed with the quarterback, and the quarterback is very kind to him. And through all of that, this little boy is drawn into the story. Oh, I want to be like that guy. My dad takes me to a game. This guy's a star. He's nice to me. I, I, that's what I want to do. And, and he starts to get drawn into the story. And the coaches start to give him a chance to play. And he grows and grows and grows in the story until finally he becomes who he is. I think that's what, what on-the-job training is about. I, I mentioned Arliss. Uh, she was uh, sometimes she plays with the praise band, but she teaches three or four or five kids in the morning. Uh, I'm sorry, three or four or five kids in the afternoon. She teaches them piano lessons, and, and I've kind of watched her. She'll talk to them before they ever say they want to play the piano. Right? She'll, she'll talk to them and she'll tell them how cool it is to play the piano. And, and they'll say, "Oh man, I want to get. I want to be part of that story. I think you know. I think it's cool to play the piano too." And so they, they start to come into the story. And then when they sit down, she talks to them about playing the piano. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then she might show them something. This is what you'll be able to do. Oh, I want to do that. And then she starts to teach them, and then she has them do it. And now they're part of the story. They're walking right with her. They're part of what she's doing, and they're going to grow and grow and grow in that story. I think that's what on-the-job training is. In this text, it's, it's like the story that God lays out for us. And His Spirit today would pull us into the story. That's what this is all about. It has, it has a prologue. It has an episode. And it has an ending. A following to the episode. The epilogue. Okay? It has all three parts. God's bringing us into the story to give us on-the-job training the way it was meant to be. With Jesus. And, and, and this is what I want you to know with this on the, on the job training. It's real, it's personal, it's about grace. With everything. Would, would you read, read that with me? It's real, it's personal, it's about grace. And, and everything here. It's real, it's personal, it's about grace. This text begins with John the Baptist um, being thrown into prison. Now, if you were here last week, you heard about some of these same disciples that Jesus is going to call today. You heard about Andrew. He was a disciple of John the Baptist. And when John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God, pointing at Jesus, he went after Jesus. And then he got his brother, and he found Jesus that way too. So I'm guessing that maybe his brother Peter was a follower of John the Baptist too. Don't know that for sure. But I don't know what he was doing that far from home, but he wasn't. And then John, who was also a follower of John the Baptist, was there. He was the other one that followed Jesus that day. And, and, and in this text today, you have John and his brother. And, and I'm wondering if his brother wasn't there, too. It kind of makes sense. So maybe all four of them have followed John the Baptist. And what, what happened to John the Baptist? He's in jail. He's going to be brutally beheaded. And now these boys have gone home to go back fishing. They've left where John was doing his thing. And they've gone even farther up north to, to the Sea of Galilee. And they're back, back in the family business. They're, they're, they're fishing. By the way... Jews way up there, the, the Jews in the culture down Jerusalem, 
they thought there was something weird about them. They didn't have their theology very straight, and, and they kind of had inbred with the Gentiles somewhat. They, they just were kind of looked down in society. But Jesus went there. Jesus went there. He went to them when they didn't know which side was up because John the Baptist was in prison now. The one they followed and he was going to be dead. They didn't know what they were doing. They kind of just went back to fishing. See, that's the first thing about on-the-job training. Somebody steps into our lives and shows us how much they care. I, I don't know what burdens you carry. I, I know what burdens those disciples carry. And Jesus came after them. Traveled even farther to the outskirts of, Jew, of Israel to find them. Our story begins personally. Jesus comes for you. And, and this story is real. Uh, in, in the devotions that I, I kind of put together this week, I, I tell the story of being, uh, I think I was in fourth or fifth grade, and, and um, I, I saw a, a, a movie, and it showed how they trained the soldiers to go over to fight in World War II. And I don't remember much about the movie, but I remember this. They, these guys were crawling through barbed wire in the mud. And as a kid, right, as a, as a boy, oh, this looks good, right? And, I mean, they're crawling through the barbed wire, and they're getting dirty. But then they said that they were firing live bullets six inches above their heads. Now, even as a fourth and fifth grade, I thought, ooh, that ain't cool. You know, they can get killed doing this. So the message they were giving those guys is that this is real. It's not playtime. John the Baptist was in prison. He was going to die. Life with Jesus is real. It's not playtime. And he, re- he was putting his life on the line to come after these disciples, to come after these men. And he put his life on the line and lost it to come after you, to draw you into his story. I, I don't know what struggles you have with burdens you carry, what disappointments you have, what emptiness you feel. But I know right now God's Spirit would touch your heart with Jesus, would make Him real for you and personal. And by grace, His, his undeserved love, His, his love poured down upon us. That, that's what the song is saying. So his, his undeserved love poured down upon us unconditionally. The Spirit of God right now is touching your hearts. Touching my heart. To bring me into the story. So I can grow and, and maybe for the first time and maybe renewed in, in walking with Jesus. So, that's the prologue. Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of God is near. You know what that meant? Repent, of course, is to turn away from something and to turn to something else. But everybody likes to say, oh, you know, God, God is around here somewhere. Oh, you got you to scale a mountain. you got to you swim in the ocean. you got to jump through hoops. Now, Jesus came and said, no, God is right here. That, that word that's translated near is, is agus in the Greek. Guys, say it's a great word. Agus. Say agus. Agus. It means he's right here. Okay? It means he's right in front of you. The beginning of our story, the prologue, is that Jesus Christ, by His Spirit, steps right into your heart this moment, and He says, the kingdom of God is right here with you, with me. Yeah. God is here for you, in Jesus. disciples got that message. As they got that message, we, we enter into the episode of our story, the call of Jesus. Jesus came to first two, then the other two disciples, and, and he said, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Come, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. He, he approached them in the work that they did to connect with them. 
you know, we, we think of, I, I've left my cold back there, but, but we, we, we think of fishing kind of, you know, you know, this nice pastime where we're sitting uh, on, uh, on the side of a, a river or a lake, right, and, and we're just kind of throwing it in, relaxing, uh, you know, uh, I'm having something cool, cool to drink and, and just kind of talking to somebody, right? That's, that's, how he, that's not how these guys fish. They, they had these, all these nuts that they had to prepare and they had to keep in order and they had to throw out and they had to bring back in. It was backbreaking work. Jesus stepped into their lives where they were to say, just, just as I have made you, I'm going to call you into the kingdom to walk with me and to share my love and my life with others. I gotta ask a question. How many of you guys like to fish? I don't. I gotta tell you that. You know? I hate it. I hate sitting uh, on the, by this lake and getting eaten up by, I mean, I feed the mosquitoes more than I eat the fish. You know? It's, and, and just sitting there, kind of, you know, getting baked under the sun, right? Throwing the hook in the bushes. I mean, hey, it's just not my idea of a lot of fun, right? I wasn't made that way to like that stuff. But this is the way I like to fish. Put my wetsuit on. Throw a tank on my back. Get a spear gun. I'm going after fish. I love it. I absolutely love it. Which one is better? <laughs> no, no, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. It's how we're made. I, I think sometimes Jesus talks about being fishers of people because these guys are fishermen. In another place, he talks about planting seeds because a lot of people were farmers there. How many of you guys come from a farming background? Anybody? Yeah, he talks about farming, right? Planting the seeds. I often wonder what he said to Matthew, the tax collector. I mean, I know he connected with him somehow, you know. Maybe, maybe something like, you know, Matthew, you kept such great records as a tax collector. I want you to keep records of people so we don't lose them. I don't know how he did it. All I know is how he made Matthew. He used him to reach out with the love of Jesus Christ. Now, that's why in, in a few weeks we're going to do this shape inventory thing. We're going to look at ourselves and see how God made us and how he can use us in the kingdom. But what I can tell you right now is however He has made you to be, whatever experiences you have had, wherever He has put you in life, right there, He calls you in a real way, in the way you have been made, to reach out and to share the love that you know in Jesus. That's what He was teaching these disciples. It's personal because God wove you together inside your mom. That's what it says in the Psalms, right? He knit you together. And He gave you this purpose. Huh? It's, he gave you this purpose to reach out with His love. And He has made you to do that by His grace. You know, a lot of times we, um, I think we struggle with this, uh, because we don't personalize it. The first person that God has called you to show His love to, just the way you are, are those who are closest in your lives. Your husband, your wife, your children, and your grandchildren, your nephews, your extended family, he has made you just who you are. Your brothers or your sisters. You see? Parents, He has called you to follow Jesus and share His love, number one, with your children. You know what I mean? In ways that only you can do. Not only because you're unique and God has made you unique, but He has put you in that unique place. You see? God wants us to personalize this stuff. It's real for us, and He wants us to personalize it. You have the wondrous gift of being able to give Jesus to those who you love the most. And 
certainly branching out from there to everyone. But first, as who he is made, he made these guys fishermen. So he talked them in, into terms of being fishermen. Moms, if he's made you a loving, caring mom, how do you think you can share Jesus with others? Made by loving and caring, does that work out? Dad, if he's made you somebody who likes to work really hard, you think maybe you can work hard at that? See what I mean? Whatever he has made you to do, however he has shaped you, you're called and empowered to walk in his grace and to share his grace. Isn't that neat stuff? That's being drawn into the story. It's like Arliss, when she has all these uh, little folks and you teach them piano, she doesn't teach each one the same. She doesn't have each one play the same thing. She crafts what she's doing to the individual. And Jesus crafts for you the calling that he gives all of us. Okay, the epilogue here. Jesus' example and model. There's two parts here. That The, the, the first one is, is surprising. I think you'd almost miss it. You know, that, that makes sense, so, doesn't it? When, when uh, Arliss is, is teaching, at one point, she has the kids watch her play. Oh, you're not, you're not getting this part. These are 16th notes. You play these a little faster. See, they're different than 8th notes. They're different than quarter notes. They're 16th. You play them a little faster, right? Guys, when you co- have, how many of you coached God? Guys, how many of you coached? Anything. All right? You ever do it when you say, watch me? Here, watch. I, I, I just want you to see this, right? It's, it's called modeling. That, that's what you do. You say, watch, watch me. That's what Jesus does here. He's called, he's shown that he's pulled the disciples in by his personal love for them. He's called them to be fishers of men. He's met them in their lives where they're at, just as he created them. And now he shows them what it looks like. He first goes to the synagogues, and he says, repent for the kingdom of God is near. It's right here. Why would he go to the synagogues? I mean, these are the folks that thought they were spiritual, right? They were the folks that thought they were religious, the good folks. You know anybody like that? You know anybody who would say, well, you know, I don't know about the Jesus stuff, but I'm real spiritual. You don't have Jesus. You got nothing. All you got is a bunch of high-sounding words. And maybe your stomach goes up and down because of something you ate. The only true spirituality, the only thing that truly ties you to God is Jesus. You know anybody around you who likes to think they're spiritual apart from Jesus? It's kind of hard to come alongside of him, isn't it? A little frustrating. Kind of hard to be patient. Show them the love that you have for them in Jesus until you earn the right to talk to them about Jesus. Jesus went to the people who thought they were spiritual first. Because those who think they're spiritual apart from Jesus are really in the darkest of darkness. Now, the second part is what we might what we might think. Jesus went throughout Galilee, preaching the good news, healing every disease and sickness, even the demon possessed. Jesus went here to those folks. You know, every time you see, there's so many places. Read the Gospels, okay? There's so many places when you see where Jesus went. When you see the people to whom he went. If you're smart, if, 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 you're, if you're honest, I shouldn't say smart, if you're honest, you say, boy, you know, I don't think I would have gone there. He went to the lepers. Would you go there? He went to the lepers. He went to those who were horribly sick. He went to the outcasts. He, when the demon possessed came to him, those who had been overrun by Satan himself, he did not run away from them. He healed them. My son, Jeff, is in, in nurses' training, and in this quarter, he has to be in the mental health unit of a hospital. What do you think Dad told him? Be careful. Huh? 
be careful. Places that maybe you wouldn't choose to go. Because it's dangerous. That's whom Jesus went to. You know, there's also situations and places we try to avoid, even with those who are closest to us. You know, when your sons, fathers, want to talk about something that makes you really uncomfortable, and you really would rather avoid it, say, maybe I'm tired tonight. Let's, let's talk later. Or maybe your daughter's moms want to talk about something right now. But maybe I've been working all day. I got something else I got to do. Or maybe your spouse needs to talk about something today. And you know, you, you've kind of drifted from each other, and, and this is this is just kind of painful to get this figured out, to work through this. You see. The uncomfortable places Jesus went. It's not only about them. It's about us. And the place He puts us to share His love and to share Jesus. Always first with those who are closest. And at times, those are the folks you want to run away from. And always with a word of grace and always reaching out to all. It's real. It's personal. It's about the wondrous love of Jesus, unconditional. It's always there.